A warm good afternoon to all our delegates who are coming in from India, Asia, Pac, Europe, and the US. Welcome to day five and the final day of India Water Innovation Week. We have had a scintillating week for the last four days. We have had close to 3,200 people who have logged in, and 50 speakers for uh, across 16 countries. So I think we again have a well-renowned list of speakers for day five today on a very specific niche topic that we have seen gaining traction in India, which is sludge uh, management and dewatering and biosolids management. So without further, uh, you know, taking any time, I would like to invite Miss Daria Krajic Kopp from the Netherlands Water Partnership to deliver her quick opening remarks. Miss, over to you, Daria. Thank you, uh, thank you, and uh, it is a pleasure to be able to join you and to connect also to the audience in different countries uh, and discuss this important topic, especially in these times when everything is different. Um, so today I will try also to uh, make a special attention to the resource recovery for sustainable sludge management and introduce Dutch approaches. Uh, this is just an opening remark, so I will just highlight a few approaches. And, uh, uh, and the organization I work for. Next slide, please. I'm working for Netherlands Water Partnership, and uh, we are here to share, connect, and involve different parties with the Dutch water sector. Next slide, please. We are the largest international water network in the Netherlands with approximately 200 members, and we are Uh, we unite the Dutch water expertise and we are the first point of call for anybody from abroad searching for the Dutch water expertise. On our website, you can also see what kind of activities we are organizing. Next slide, please. And also with these 200 organizations, we are having members from different sectors, from the businesses, small medium enterprises, NGOs, knowledge institutes, universities, but also governmental organizations. We all work together and on integrated water management and also on the provision of sustainable solutions worldwide. Uh, next slide, please. So within these organizations, more than half are the businesses and about 20%, 18% are governmental organizations and knowledge institutes and NGOs. Next slide, please. The water challenges are also the water opportunities for us. So uh, we, we act when there is too much water, too little water or too polluted water as the Dutch water sector. But coming back to the, our uh, topic of today, I would like to go to the next slide, please. And say something why, why we are doing this. So current economy that we live in is the linear where we take, make and waste where waste and pollution are actually not accidents, but they're the consequences of decisions made at the design stage. Next, please. Also later today, you will also hear more about the circular economy. What we are trying to achieve nowadays is to design out of waste and pollution and to shift toward the circular economy as waste doesn't exist in nature. We would like to keep products and materials in use and regenerate natural systems. On the right hand side, you can also see the photo of uh, mining, phosphorus mining in India, uh, where actually we are currently mainly dumping all the phosphorus that we are excreting in a wastewater and sludge. And I will also later come back to that and see what can be done about it. Uh, currently, we depend on phosphorus because uh, it's, uh, we need it for uh, food and plant growth. And we depend strongly on the 70, no, let's say, of the countries that are having these phosphorus um, uh, reserves. Next, please. Here you can see how the phosphate raw commodity price, for example, in 2008, rocketed, because that was a consequence of the huge demand in certain parts of the world that also created certain measures of the countries that are producing phosphorus, uh, introducing the export taxes. And that, that also uh, was, as a result, the, the eight times higher the phosphorus price. Next, please. What we are doing in, uh, in the Netherlands, 
and these uh, as and actually that is that we kind of grew out grew to it and that is cross sectoral cooperation uh, within the Dutch water sector. Uh, having in mind that about 60% of the world population does not have uh, access to safely managed sanitation, we're also focusing efforts on solutions for low and middle income countries through cooperation. In Delft, there is uh, Institute for Water Education, IAG, that is also focusing on solutions for on-site sanitation or non sewer sanitation systems. With NGOs in the Netherlands, such as, such as this is a small example of one NGO, uh, aqua for all that is focusing on scaling solutions for, uh, from sanitation. So for example, in Kenya, where there is a, a coal producing uh, a company from pit to product. We're also one of our members is the FICA Sludge Management Alliance, who is also working worldwide. And then again, cooperating with the Dutch government. Next slide, please. Talking about uh, resources recovery, again, that is a trend that's been, uh, let's say, uh, um, accepted in the Netherlands more than 10 years ago, where the water authorities uh, are dealing with the, with the kind of approaching the wastewater management as uh, energy and uh, raw material factories. That is how the wastewater treatment facilities are perceived. There are also uh, documents available online where you can see the Dutch roadmap and vision for the coming uh, years. And you can see that uh, uh, the, the Dutch water authorities, they are trying to recover energy, but also nutrient and also recycle water. And that uh, through innovative processes and in cooperation with knowledge institutes and also private sector and businesses. Uh, next slide, please. Having uh, limited time to address you, I would just also like to highlight again uh, uh, one of the examples from the one water treatment facility in the Netherlands, where the sludge is undergoing fermentation and uh, recovering methane, then uh, providing electricity to uh, uh, more than 100, actually 250 households in the vicinity of the wastewater treatment facility from the uh, sewage sludge. So uh, next slide, please. Again, um, we are also trying to increase the biogas production. And that is again through cooperation with the different sectors in the, in the Netherlands. We can see that the businesses cooperate with water authorities, but also universities. And uh, the result of that, uh, with the help of EU funding, is a product called EFIRA, where the organic material uh, has been increasingly removed together with biogas production and that all at mesophilic temperatures. Then I will also uh, highlight the, the another approach. Yes, the next one, please. Thank you. And that is a new approach that is uh, also happening for the last years. And that's a EU again funded project uh, called FARIO, where uh, PHA stands for polyhydroxyalkanoates, bio-based and biodegradable thermoplastic polyesters. And Rio is coming from the Dutch word for real water, which means the sewage, where we try to create a new value chain uh, through uh, treating the primary and secondary sludge from wastewater treatment and uh, uh, creating conditions for fatty acid productions and uh, accumulating uh, PHA and then extracting it and, and using it actually in industry and as a fertilizer coatings, for example, or biodegradable bags. This is a project that is uh, currently piloting. And again, you can see who are the, the partners here, the private sector, uh, the water authorities, uh, but also uh, universities and TU Delft and Vetsus, for example. So um, again, it's a small um, kind of selection of, of, of the Dutch, uh, let's say, uh, approaches. And then I would like to go to the next slide, please. And then also to come back to the, the story from the beginning, and that story is a phosphorus story. And just to mention a few, uh, yeah, please go back to the previous one. Thank you. And that is, uh, I wanted to mention uh, uh, the production of struvite, which uh, in the past was causing problems. You can see on the, on the, on the photos to the right. 
because it was precipitating spontaneously, but now we're controlling it and uh, creating the slow release fertilizer in the form of uh, magnesium ammonium phosphate. And um, we are having also uh, products on the, the Dutch companies and technology providers that are uh, selling, let's say, the, the technologies. Um, so in this way, we could actually recover the phosphorus from the, from the wastewater. And in the Netherlands, it is also allowed, the legislation allows it to be used, it was extensively tested and used as a fertilizer. And now I would uh, like to slowly finalize my uh, opening talk and go to the next slide, please. And of course, still to mention that uh, uh, we at Netherlands Water Partnership, we also cooperate with the students of Dutch universities. And recently, a group of Dutch students has conducted the research on um, a sustainable sludge treatment in the Netherlands and uh, focusing on resource recovery. And soon, uh, Netherlands Water Partnership will have a publication to be uh, uh, shared as a portfolio with, uh, with the interested parties. So I would like to thank you once again for having me here. Thank you, Daria, for sharing this work done by Netherlands in the sludge management sector. Uh, we now start our sessions for today by handing it over to Mark, who, is, who was the moderator yesterday and today also. So moderator, uh, Mark would be taking the session through going forward. Over to you, Mark. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you, Kailash. Uh, this is the... Uh, Biosolids Management Day, which concludes what has been a hugely successful inaugural Indian Water Innovation Week. Uh, I understand that already this week uh, we've exceeded 3,200 visitors and hopefully today we'll, we'll manage to, uh, to break all records. But I'd like to congratulate the organisers, SWWI, for uh, the programme that they've put together. I think it's been a fantastic achievement to uh, have attracted that number of visitors. Uh, I'm Mark Barker, the CEO of WEX Global, uh, which is an international summit bringing together all of the, or a number of the world's top professionals from the water sector to exchange ideas and, and opportunities related to the water energy nexus and uh, the transition to a circular economy. Uh, we're going to hear uh, from a number of those experts today, as well as uh, some new colleagues that I've met, I'm delighted to say, as a result of being involved in the innovation week. Uh, we're going to be discussing the future of biosolids handling, which of course is something intrinsically linked with the transition to a circular economy. Our view of a humble sludge has been transformed from an issue of waste disposal to a critical process of transforming waste into valuable resources. Where once we talked only of landfill, we're now dreaming of bio-based cities powering the circular economy. Urban bio-waste and wastewater are, of course, circular feedstocks that can be used to produce any number of innovative circular economy products, such as biogases for our grids, biofuels to run our cars, and a multitude of other products, including bio-based chemicals, plastics, and fertilizers. So what are the opportunities for water utilities in all of this? And how can these products be valorized and the investment secured? This afternoon, we're going to be hearing about the answers to some of these questions. And we're gonna begin by listening to four case studies uh, from companies and utilities that have already been leading the way for a number of years in resource recovery. And after that, we'll be having a panel debate, which is looking to the future of biorefinery. But first of all, I'm delighted to say uh, that to give us a, a global overview and a peek into the future, we have a keynote presentation from Frank Regala, the head of innovation at Aqualia, who is acknowledged to be one of the world's leading experts in this field. He's currently heading up a range of product projects from laboratory to commercial scale, which seem to find ever better and more imaginative uses for sludge and wastewater. If any of you've seen the uh, Brave Blue World documentary, you'll have seen Frank filling up his car with biogas produced from algae grown in a wastewater treatment plant in southern Spain. Whilst many of us in our idle moments uh, have fairly simple dreams, such as hoping one day that our team might win the premiership or of perhaps more appropriately here, the IPL, Frank dreams instead only of algae and of a world without sludge. Whilst I uh, understand this may alarm some of us here today who are dependent on sludge for our livelihoods, have no fear, Frank tells me that that day uh, is some way off in the future. So for now, 
We need to make our decisions based on the very best and the very latest innovations in sludge management. And to give you a global overview to all of this, I'd like to hand the floor to Mr. Frank Regala. Over to you, Frank. I, uh, I'm very honored to be here, Mark. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's the first time in my life I'm actually in India. So obviously it's a special honor. Before I visited Japan, China, Thailand, but never managed to visit this wonderful country and culture. Uh, hopefully uh, the sludge session will move a little up the schedule in the future. Right now we see it as the end of the line and I wanted to show you a little bit how that can be changed. I work for Aqualia. Uh, is it not, my slides are not moving. What's going on? I can't move my slides. Let's click on the PowerPoint and use the next screen. And use the arrow screen. Oh, okay. Here we are. I work for Aqualia. Aqualia is a small water company in about 20 countries. You can see our most eastern activities in Oman and Qatar. And we go all the way to Spanish speaking South America and, of course, the Mediterranean. 17 countries overall. Our main activity is actually run water systems, both on the drinking water and the wastewater side for cities of medium size, all the way from Ostrava in the Czech Republic to Caltanissetta in Italy. And of course in, Italy, in Spain, many medium sized cities. We also do contract operations. That's why we are in the Middle East or in the Mediterranean and do a lot of turnkey large scale construction. We had a short venture in India a few years ago, but didn't yet into, enter the market fully. Here you can see one example of the large turnkey plants. We're just finishing one in Bogota, of about 3 million people equivalent with all the large wastewater and nutrient treatment and of course solids handling. And of course the big challenge was to finish this plant that is supposed to be online about a year from now. And despite of all the obstacles in uh, managing the health situation, the construction went fully ahead with all the health protocols in place. As uh, Daya already said, we are living of an old model that the Romans invented of bringing water into the cities and flushing it out very rapidly. In Spain, we have still some wonderful infrastructure from that time, but that's an entirely linear, linear model where you dilute the resources and flush them away as fast as possible. We have about a thousand different plants that we operate, so a thousand different uh, toys that we can optimize. And that is my main job, to try to find clever solutions to make them more efficient and to lower the cost and recover the value. And we have about 15 projects always uh, active with various financing from the European community mainly, but also from local governments trying to uh, reduce the cost and improve the value of our services. One of the big opportunities we have is we actually treat about 600 million cubic meters of water, both on the drinking water and the wastewater side, and that is a river of energy. Today, we destroy that energy by pumping in 0.5 kilowatt hours of electricity to oxidize organic matter. And if you actually extrapolate that to the European population of 500 million people, that's two nuclear power plants just to clean wastewater. And of course, India has about three times that population, so would need six nuclear power plants just to clean wastewater. Where in fact, if you measure the content of energy in wastewater, you have two kilowatt hours of thermal energy in an average municipal wastewater. Today, we use electricity to destroy that. And obviously my dream is to harvest that and drive my car on the wastewater energy. In addition, we have nutrients in the wastewater, nitrogen and phosphorus. Dai already mentioned how important that is for our agriculture. So that's another opportunity to gain that back. And that is where we've been working and tweaking the technologies. We do have a baseline that was invented in Manchester about 100 years ago by Arden Lockett, activated sludge. That's about 95% of all wastewater treatment plants look like that. And today we try to improve every little step, optimize the oxygen transfer, and of course, 
optimize the sludge treatment. That's why I wanted to focus today on the side stream recovery, both why, with Anamox, which is uh, one technology that you can bring to uh, treat your dewatering liquid and reduce the nitrogen that is being sent in circles around the treatment plant, which typically is 15 to 20 percent of the energy. It's just ammonia that is running in circles around the plant. So we can capture that ammonia and treat it with a new technology that we call Anamox. It's a special bacteria that uh, grows very slowly, but is very efficient in converting nitrogen and doesn't need as much oxygen as conventional nitrification and denitrification. And we have been working with that for almost 10 years now, bringing it all the way to full scale, thanks to the initial work of the University of Santiago de Compostela. But now we have about a handful of plants using that technology on full scale and also converting a few other plants that we have to reduce this energy need of nitrogen that goes in circles from the dewatering. In addition, Daya mentioned phosphorus as an important resource that can be recovered, especially, of course, once it's concentrated in that dewatering liquid from the sludge treatment. And we've done that as well, uh, trying to produce struvite, magnesium, ammonium phosphate. So you have phosphorus and ammonia in that stream. You just need a little bit of magnesium to precipitate this fertilizer, which uh, also is already done on large scale. In Madrid, for instance, we have this very large treatment plant, Ostara. But we do have an issue that today that fertilizer is not always authorized. In Spain, you cannot yet use it on the field. And it is not yet always competitive because magnesium is an important cost factor in producing struvite. So we've been working with magnesium uh, waste material and making it more competitive with conventional fertilizers. In addition, of course, to focusing on the side stream, we focus on digestion. There you can do a lot of intensification to get much more biogas out of your sludge. And thermal hydrolysis is really the key that we found to be most efficient because it allows you to half the digester volume, double the kinetics, and get a very good biogas yield. And in addition, uh, totally disinfected and very easy to dewater solids of high quality that farmers like. So that is one thing that you definitely want to include in your optimized sludge treatment stream. But we're going a little further in our dream, trying to reduce sludge rather than just uh, putting band-aids on the existing infrastructure. And you can actually change the conventional activated sludge to be much less productive <laughs> in far, as far as yielding solids. So trying to reduce that sludge occurrence in the first place. You can actually rethink conventional activated sludge and divide it in two different steps. The A stage where you absorb the organic matter that then can be well digested and the B stage where you remove the nitrogen with a efficient system like the Anamox process. And we've done that now on pilot already demonstrated here in Madrid that that's possible to grow these Anamox bacteria even on the diluted and cold wastewater rather than only on the concentrated and hot re re stream from the dewatering. And we've gone through various uh, cycles. Of course, you have to grow these bacteria. It takes a while, but here you can see at the end of this test already, we have uh, a very good removal. You can see here that ammonia with Anamox can be reduced to less than 10 from a 50 milligram raw influent. And also the nitrates are converted without needing extra organic matter. Then we worked on the upstream anaerobic treatment. I know in India there are some direct treatment of municipal waste with anaerobic treatment as they, they have it in Brazil or in the Middle East. We tried to adapt it to the Spanish conditions and you can see uh, various years of experiments where we can actually remove about 70% of the pollution and convert it directly to methane without electricity input. And that is what something we had, we wanted to perfect for reuse using an anaerobic membrane bioreactor. So that would allow us to uh, cut the solids production tremendously by converting the organic matter directly into energy. And of course, also have a very positive balance and a clean and disinfected 
reuse water that still conserves nitrogen and phosphorus and can be directly applied to the fields. That's something we tried also on large demonstration scale here, a 40 cubic meter prototype that uh, was implemented about uh, two hours south of Madrid in a full scale wastewater treatment plant. You can see here the membrane units as well. We used full scale membranes uh, to demonstrate this on in practical field conditions. You can see it was a mixed wastewater, both municipal and industrial, therefore very concentrated. One particular issue was the sulfate concentration that is, of course is unfavorable for anaerobic treatment. Nevertheless, we can show you here a few years of data. We can show that we can reach full secondary treatment about more than 90% COD removal and the sludge occurrence is four times less. So Mark said that might endanger all our colleagues who are selling sludge treatment equipment. But of course, it also opens new avenues to this treatment plant that has much, much less energy consumption and of course, much less carbon emission, even though in this case, because of the sulfate, the methane yield was still three times less than you would expect. Nevertheless, we could cover our energy needs. This was a energy neutral system. So you are producing as much energy as you consume. And that's why we now use this technology quite a bit in many places where it fits, whether it's on industrial wastewater, of course, whether it's on uh, municipal wastewater for smaller plants, or whether it is on even leachate from wastewater treatment. One particular example where we use it is in decentralized wastewater treatment. One of the problems is, of course, that today we dilute our, re our waste, our uh, urine or our phosphorus with uh, 150 liters or 200 liters of clean water, and then we send it down to the wastewater treatment plant. It's much more difficult to recover. Maybe it's more efficient to separate at the source. That's a project we do together with various communities in Sweden and the Netherlands, trying to separate gray water, yellow water, black water, and make the best out of it and recover at the source. And anaerobic MBR is one compact system that is easily placed in the bottom of a building. Here you can see this building in Vigo in the northwest of Spain, where we demonstrate that te technology to recover energy and irrigation water at the source without going through the conventional ways, but having an energy neutral ir irrigation and nutrient recovery system. But uh, Mark already mentioned my biggest dream was go green. And uh, we also worked on a completely different technology, which is based on algae. All of you know that if you place a puddle of water in the sun, or if you have your pool unclean for a while, the algae will grow very fast. They are one of the first and of the most frugal organisms and only need a little bit of nutrient, a little bit of water, a little bit of sunshine and will profligate tremendously. And what we can actually gain from algae is oxygen, free oxygen without electrical blowers, and that is why we use it in symbiosis with the bacteria in the wastewater. The bacteria, of course, will consume the oxygen of the algae, produce CO2, CO2 for the algae, so we have a perfect symbiosis, so that at the end of this treatment, we have clean water, we have energy that we can harvest from the biomass and the fertilizer of the leftover algae. And this is something we have systematically developed over the last 10 years, uh, since 2010, thanks to a big grant also from the EU to demonstrate this on full scale. And we've gone all that steps from the pilots to the prototypes, producing biomethane directly from the algae and therefore convert wastewater into energy. And today we have a large two hectare plant operating on industrial scale. You can see here the preliminary construction uh, with the algae raceways, each one 300 meters by 18 meters. We have four of those now operating, and it was all inaugurated by the EU Commissioner of Energy in 2017. So we now have two years of full-scale operations, and we can tell you what you can gain from treating wastewater with algae. I took here the example of a football field. You know that in, uh, Mark mentioned it, we are all uh, proud if our football team wins the Liga or even the Champions League, uh, you know, Madrid has uh, 
a very famous cl club. And here you see the stadium of Bernabeu that is about one hectare size. Well, in one hectare football field, you can treat about the wastewater of 5,000 people. So 5,000 spectators could treat their wastewater with algae in that football field. That means about 1,000 cubic meter of wastewater would be converted for reuse. At the same time, you would save the energy bills of the 20 players on the pitch because you don't need the oxygen and the electricity to oxidize your wastewater. And you would produce about 100 tons of algae from that per year. And that you can actually convert to methane and that will fuel 20 vehicles. So again, all the players on the pitch drive home for free with clean green algae fuel. That you can compare with conventional biofuels, maybe from palm oil diesel or from ethanol from sugarcane. There in one hectare of those cultures, you can fuel about five vehicles. In one hectare of algae, you can actually fuel 20 vehicles. So it's uh, four times more efficient than conventional biofuels. And at the same time, you don't need arable land, you're not competing with food, you don't need fresh water, you use the wastewater, and you don't need fertilizers since you use the wastewater nutrients. So that is really a wonderful thing, in addition, of course, to the saving all the electricity that is today wasted on oxidizing organic matter and wastewater treatment. So that is a new thing that my car runs exclusively on, methane, and every week I'm very proud to drive by our local wastewater treatment plant and fill up with the uh, the residuals that our Madrid Mediterranean citizens produce. One key question, of course, is it all worthwhile? And we did some very detailed analysis on the energy balance. And you can see that here that about uh, four times more energy is produced by the algae wastewater treatment than it is needed, which is very different from other biofuels, like if you win diesel from corn or from mice, you only, or you, or, or from soybeans or from corn, you only have about uh, energy efficiency of one. Here you are four times more efficient. And therefore in Aqualia, more and more, we run our fleet on biomethane and have about a handful now of treatment plants and anaerobic digesters already equipped with biomethane upgrading. So that's all I wanted to tell you today that sludge will disappear. I'm not sure in how many decades, but uh, we obviously want to get rid of the concept of wastewater and the concept of sludge and convert it all to resources. And uh, as Daria mentioned, there's many different entities, many universities that work together. We also work with about 50 different universities with many different suppliers to reinvent and rethink the way we can organize our infrastructure and hopefully be a net energy producer in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that uh, uh, great uh, overview uh, of what is happening with, with biosolids handling and resource recovery. Uh, we've had quite a number of questions come in uh, from the audience, some of which are of a very uh, technical nature. So if it's, we're running a little bit late, so if it's okay by you, um, we will forward those to you by, by email for answering later, if that's all right. The one uh, quick question, which is a bit of crystal ball gazing, which has come from the audience is, uh, um, how long do you think it'll be before the cost of processing sludge is uh, fully recovered by uh, reuse and recovery of materials? Well, it's very close. In, 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 in a place like Chiclana, where we have this algae plant, obviously it is a plant with a net return, which has never been heard of before, that you can actually get a return from a wastewater treatment plant that in five or 10 years, the treatment plant will only produce profits and no longer be a cost to the community. With conventional sludge, of course, it is much more difficult, uh, although we have a handful of plants in Europe that are energy neutral and um, don't really have a large cost on the community other than the personnel that works there. Okay, so there you have it. The, uh the cost of rec recovering uh, the processing of sludge is, is much nearer, perhaps, than we'd previously previously thought. Frankie, thank you very thank thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to move swiftly on now uh, to to look at um, some of the case studies uh, this afternoon, which are 
uh, examining successful, successful implementations uh, of uh, projects within, uh, within the bioeconomy. Our first case study is going to examine the choice of biosolids treatment and resource recovery using the example of Valentin Wastewater Treatment Plant in Paris. Uh, to make the presentation, I'd like to welcome Miguel Angel Sanz, who is the Director of Strategic Development for Suez. And for those of you that attended the desalination day earlier in the week, you will know that in addition to his remarkable expertise in the field of biosolids, he's also a past president and current director of the International Desalination Association. So to tell you all about Valentin, I'd like to hand over the floor to Miguel Angel now. Thank you, Mark, for the nice introduction and for uh, and Kailas also just to invite all of us just to, to share our experiences in, in this important week. Eh? So uh, um, I, first, I will try just to, to share my screen. You can see my screen now. So as, uh, as Mark was saying, I, I try just to, to introduce one of the best known experiences in biosolid treatment. It's, a, it's like a, a biorefinery or a biofactory just to produce uh, resource recovery and energy recovery in a wastewater treatment plant, as we, my previous speaker was explaining. And this example is one of the largest plants in Paris uh, metropolitan area, is Valentin Wastewater Treatment Plant. Just to, to, to explain how is uh, the Ile de France, so the France island is the province where Paris is integrated, as you can see in the map, is full of wastewater treatment plant. But the more important plan are handled by the CAP. Later on, we can see what is the CAP, who are treating the water, who are going upstream and downstream of Seine River. Seine River is going from the southeast part of Paris to the northwest of Paris, and is crossing the city on the middle, as you well know. The, the great Paris area is around 12 million inhabitants, almost 12 and a half. It's the first industrial area of, of France. It's more so 30% of the GMP. And the has is one of the more tourist cities in the world. Uh, previous to COVID was 30 million visitors every year. Our customer was the CIAP. The CIAP is the, uh, is the public agency who is in charge of all the, of the sea weight of the metropolitan metropolitan area, not for the small cities, yes, but, but the herd of the other, treating more or less uh, the, the, the waste of uh, 9, million, 9 million people connected in an area of 1,800 uh, 1, square kilometers. 85% of the water is municipal, only 5% industrial, and the remaining 10% is coming from the stone water, which is treated instantaneously. The capacity of treatment is uh, 2 million 700 thousand cubic meter per day is more or less 20% uh, uh, of the all wastewater of France and is treated in only six huge uh, wastewater treatment plants. There is 450 kilometer underground just to collect the wastewater and there is also have the capacity to store it uh, wastewater and store water for 900,000 cubic meter in the, in, the, uh, in the area you can see in this map. Just to see how the plan are placed, as you can see on the center is Paris. It's, 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 that's it's, it's in a small almond on the center of, uh, of, uh, of Ile de France. It, there is a uh, plant which places upstream the same, plants which came in from the main river. And after you can see there is plants of the center of the, of the city and downstream of the city. The downstream is the largest one uh, uh, in the world. It's a chair, so it's, it's, it's treating 1,500,000 cubic meters per day. It's 54% of the all of effluents coming from the C, from the CAP survey area. But Valenton is the second one. It's taking the water, who is the uh, wastewater, who is going upstream of the city to the same river. And thus, uh, there is an important target because the, the drinking water pl uh, plants of the uh, Paris area are coming the majority from the uh, Seine River and also from the groundwater. So it's important because in the there is the practical drinking water reuse in the, uh, in the city. There is another plant. The overall plant uh, has an addition of capacity of treatment, the 2,700,000 cubic meter per day. And you can see in the small graphic how was the sewage and the wastewater treatment plant history in the Paris area along the years. More or less at the end of the the, the, the the first decade of the year 2000, they complete the full capacity of treatment. 
the first was a chair, but Valentin was playing an important role just to improve the quality of the Seine River after the year 87. And you can see in the graphic uh, with in towns uh, is the capacity of treatment is 2 million 700, but now they, they never pass the 2 million and a half cubic meter per day. And even the rainwater is uh, decreasing because we haven't driest year along the area. You can see the, the red line in this kind of thing. So the capacity of treatment in, in, in Paris is full now for several years. Some figures from, uh, from, uh, from Valenton, as you say, is the second uh, in France in size, but it's the first just to be, to be operated by the private sector. The value is 800 million euros, it's more or less 900 million dollars, and they take a surface of 82 hectares. And the capacity is just to protect, as I said previously, the Saint River water upstream to the city. Uh, there is also 160 people operating the plant. It's uh, treating 30,000 uh, tons per year of sludge, and especially it's a showcase of, uh, of its sludge treatment or biosolid treatment. You can see in this graph the different step of this plant. The first step was started in the year, just on the in the um, south part of the slide uh, on the left in between the year 87 and 82 was the first two phases of this wastewater treatment plant with the conventional activities slash treatment the first phase was coming anaerobic digestion just to treat the sludge mainly and in the second phase uh, uh, five years later was the first incinerator to be stored there the second phase the third phase of the extension of this plant was coming in the year 2005 in the year 2005 the target was of course, to increase the capacity of treatment, you can see because it was just to treat more the nitrogen and the phosphorus to remove the other. They had a tertiary treatment just from the first phase, just to improve the quality of the water, but at the same time to change slightly the philosophy for the biosolid. First, introducing a thermal dryer and also a, 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 a pyrogasifier. The pyrolysis inside it's almost a combustion, but it's not a combustion. And at the same time, they improve, they they, they change the policy of the biosolid, trying just to do a valorization of the plant to resource recovery on this kind of thing. The last phase was in between the years 2010 and 2011. Just it's just too fast to to take the final decision. What is the the, the treatment of a sludge in this phase? And, and it was also just to improve the quality of, of the water. And in this case, was implemented just to increase the anaerobic digestion, just to have a better capacity. At the same time, they decided the final solution, the other for the half of the, of, of the sludge, was finally the incineration. That's more or less in uh, the history of the plant. You can see in a graphic way how the 82 hectare of the plant is, is divided. The blue area is a treatment uh, of water. The uh, orange area is the sludge treatment, the pink area is all the heat treatment, and the, the, the violet is the for odor removal of the plant. You can see the part of the, 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 the devices are totally covered just to avoid any, any, uh, any disturbance to the population around this plant. The sludge treatment line is, uh, you can be in a small summary, how is the final decision. The biological slug is going to the watering, going to dryers, and part of them is going to the pyrolysis, finally. The primary sludge is, is fully digested, and digestive is divided, the, 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 the sludge from the devotering area. One going directly to the incineration, the other just to fit or to complement the dryers and the pyrolysis. The tertiary sludge and the stormwater treatment is coming from the dewatering because the majority of them is more mineral, it's not necessary just to buy by digestion. There is all biogas recovery with boilers and the excess just to put into the network outside and all the energy coming from the pyrolysis and incineration is recovering the plant either in the digester either in the thermal drying and finally you have several products just as it's the dry solid at 90 percent solid is just to be used like a combustible or fertilizer but the other coming from the pyrolysis and incineration there is also a resource recovery just to to, to use building materials. All the plant is made just to valorize all, this, all the resources they have in the plant. It will go down for that. The digestion is, uh, is uh, uh, only used for, for thermal treatment, is the, the, 
Yeah, so you take and optimize the, the biogas production. You can see how it's integrating in the space, having two eyes. Uh, if you are in the in the in the road close to the, the wastewater plant, the eyes are following you. It's, in, it's very interesting also how it's integrated in the in the area. And also they have an external who is given to the city. Six megawatt of biogas is used externally of the plant. So they are exporting energy. The second and non-negligible use is just to resource recovery. The first coming from the uh, granulated slabs, there are two products, either in granules, either in pellets, just to be uh, used outside, like a fertilizer. Five years of a study with San University and San Agricultural Association was made just to optimize what is the better fertilizer they can put, uh, starting from the from the biosolids coming from the uh, from the wastewater treatment plant of Paris. So you can see the fertilizer is characterized like 60% uh, organic matter, 7% of, uh, of phosphorus, and 5% of nitrogen. But also the pellet is used to be an external combustible, just to take profit of the energy from this plant outside, even uh, from the boilers in the houses or things like that. You can see the way they have uh, the name, the trade name of this product is the uh, name in granule. And you can see here the thermal dryer in the right side. If we go to the incineration phase, uh, uh, the incineration is a, it's a fluidicide based incineration where you have uh, 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 treating more or less fit in, in all the thermal uh, the thermal solution. They take over 50% of the of the biosolid. 11,000 tons per year is coming from the from the uh, from the uh, furnace, and you can see in the right side how is a furnace outside is covered integrated in a in a building. And the treatment, the the substrate gas treatment line, they have several stages just to recover all the energy and to treat the 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 substrate gases. The first is just to preheat the air, who is into is used to oxidize the slash to incineration till 600 degrees in, in, in the wind box. After there is a phase just to recover the energy, just to be used in the thermal dryer or in thermal oil. And later on, you have the the, the last. Uh, the last uh, treatment from NOx before going to the chimney, and they are also in exchange just to use the remaining energy. Of course, there is the remaining treatment of the uh, of the substance gases. The acids are recovered, and that's the other product that they are recovered and try to valorize. They have a lot of studies just to recover in construction production even uh, using like a substrate of the cement or using blending with the concrete just to do, for example, as like you can see in this picture, uh, bricks uh, made by the, the, the acids coming from the slats. The incineration is a solution, but it's not only in Paris. Paris has another plant who has, Valenton is, a, is the same center of the plant. It's also with the incineration solution, but you can see in USA and in Lebanon, in, in Canada, in China, in Poland, in France, in, in Spain, everyone who have seen, we have over 40 references worldwide. It's a solution, especially for the large city where the agriculture is not uh, uh, just an outlet for from the from the from the uh, product coming from the slats, from the biosolids coming from the wastewater treatment plant, and also where the agriculture is quite difficult just to be used. As conclusion, you can say the digestion and incineration can be collocated. I think that there is a fight into the market. They say either you use digestion or incineration. If you are intelligent, you are clever, if you have if you study well your problem, you can collocate both in order to optimize a solution from the large city. Of course, it's not a solution from the small and medium city, but from the large city, they can pay for this kind of thing. In the case of in the case of Valentine, the evolution was starting from digestion, incorporating incineration, pyrolysis, by finally take the final decision just to combine the, uh, the, 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 uh, the anaerobic digestion and incineration as final solution. Uh, the energy efficiency is a math, it's, need, it's necessary to be optimized just to minimize the, the on and end cost. And of course, uh, Valentone is a, is a showcase of resource recovery because there is not too many plants in the world. They are using, investing the money just to, to, to look the possibility to for the resource recovery. The discussion between digestion and incineration, I think both solutions are not excluding. They could be collocated, or you can use one solution or the other, depending on the problem you can in the city. There is a very well adapted when you have large city, you have a problem just for a, a long traffic problem, 
just to evacuate the sludge or the biosolid, or in the distance with uh, the agriculture, they can not pay the recover of this, uh, this uh, organic uh, product. In this case, incineration is in case. And that is enabled just to produce, uh, to maximize the biogas production, even to, to have resource recovery as fertilizer, building materials, and even there is a necessary step just to recover minerals coming from the acids, uh, like phosphor could be recovered there, not only like uh, estrobite. And of course, it's doing the, the thermal energy, it's doing self-sufficient wastewater treatment plant. I think that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. I will try just to, to summary the history of Valenton in only a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel, for that great summary about uh, uh, Valenton. Um, again, quite a number of questions which have come in. We've just got time really for, um, for one, um, uh, for, uh, for, for one uh, uh, question and, and we, from the audience. One is, uh, how did you remove the odour from the sludge and what, what treatment do you suggest for that? Well, sorry, for? How, how, do you, how do you remove the odour from the sludge and what kind of treatment would you suggest? Uh, the, the, the could be biological treatment or chemical uh, treatment. That's depend of the concentration, especially when you are in the in the sludge area of the biosolid area. The odor are more concentrated than the uh, water treatment line. In this case, the majority of the case, the best solution is a combining of biological and chemical treatment. There is new treatment that you can use, uh, just combining the, the frozen the area just to optimize the, the, the efficiency of the of the odor removal. And that depends what is the warranty just to keep, depending how the plant is surrounding. In the case of uh, a Valenton upstream, it's a, it's, a, it's a chemical solution because there is not a, the, the pressure of, uh, of the population close to the, to the wastewater treatment plant. But for example, in Columbus, which is on the center of Paris, there is totally covered and there is a full treatment and it's uh, consuming 20% of the energy of the plant only just for other treatment. So that's the pain of the case. Okay, great. Thank you, Miguel. I'm sorry we can't Thank you. Uh, carry on talking about that, uh, but we've got to move swiftly on to our next uh, presenter, who is uh, Chris Piot, uh, the Director of uh, Resource Recovery for the District of uh, Columbia Water and Sewer Authority, otherwise known as uh, DC Water. Um, they are one of the largest and most important wastewater treatment uh, plants in the United States and indeed I think we're the very first one to adopt the uh, THP system from, from Canby. Uh, he is responsible for developing and implementing the Authority's Innovation Master Plan and its Long Range Resource Recovery Program and he's dedicated to optimizing the re re reuse of all of the Authority's underutilized resources including the biosolids products with respect to water, energy and carbon nutrients. So to tell you more about his work, I'm going to hand you over now to Chris Piot. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very excited to be here. Uh, I always get excited when I <laughs> present at events like this. Uh, my mind is already reeling at the possibilities that I saw in the two previous presentations. Frank's always very inspiring. Um, and Miguel's work is, is, uh, is really important as well. So I, I'm very honored to be, to be talking today. Um, and I, I really do want to talk about resource recovery and the circular economy. I'm, I'm again, very pleased that this term is starting to show up in our, our presentations and our, our, our events because, you know, I think we can all agree that there is value in the biosolids products and it's, you know, it's the fertilizer, it's the energy, you know, we're, we're tasked with removing um, the pollutants in air quotes from, from the wastewater and the pollutants are, uh, nutrients and carbon, but of course, you know, we don't want those ending up in the, in the receiving waters and nutrients and carbon are fertilizer and energy. So we have a system that we put in place about five years ago, we put in new digesters preceded by thermal hydrolysis um, in an effort to make clean, green, renewable energy and to uh, make a class A biosolids product that we could eventually market. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'll, I'll slip in a couple comments about energy, but it's gonna be mostly about our biosolids product. Um, so our mantra is that there is no such thing as waste, only wasted resources, which I think is really true. You know, this is sort of the ultimate test of the circular economy. Everybody, you know, we're all pre-programmed to be afraid of our own waste. Um, it's, it's why we're all still here because we've avoided the oral fecal cycle for a thousand generations. And, uh, 
and we've advanced. Um, but it it really it, it's not a waste. It's a resource, and and we sh we got to we have to stop thinking about it like a, a, as if it were a liability, and think about it as if it were an asset. Um, and that's the paradigm in our industry is that it's a liability, and you have to pay somebody to take it away. Um, and we and others, we're not the only ones, but we've we've this successfully implemented this this program um, that proves that there's a market for this material. So we don't even refer to ourselves as a wastewater treatment plant anymore, but rather as a resource recovery facility, um, recovering water, nutrients, and carbon and energy. And I, I like to separate carbon and energy because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I don't know that it is completely sustainable to take all of our biosolids and dry it and convert it into energy. I, I, I truly, this is my stance, I truly believe that some of it needs to get returned to the earth from which it came. You know, we need to return some of that carbon and those nutrients back to the earth. So we feel like we have implemented this program where we can, we can extract both energy. We're making about seven or eight megawatts of power continuously from, from turbines. Um, and recovering steam to heat up our, our thermal hydrolysis system, uh, but also making a very high, high quality biosolids product, which we return back to the, to the earth. For many years, we had a successful class B biosolids program where we brought it back to farms and, and paid somebody to do it. Um, and then, you know, we import the food back into the city and we process the food through our bodies and we return that to the treatment plants and we completed the cycle. But when we, Part of what we were doing when we designed the digester system is what we wanted to tighten that circle so that we could use the product back within the service area of, of DC water um, to solve some environmental problems in the city. There are lots of poor soils, um, but also return value back to the ratepayers. Um, and we feel like we have done that um, successfully. So I, I don't think I'm telling anybody anything new here, but we, we should always recognize that there is value in biosolids. <clears throat> There's the organic matter, which is really important, the carbon. Uh, nutrients, both macronutrients and micronutrients. <clears throat> um, there's energy. As I mentioned, we are recovering energy from our biosolids uh, by converting it to gas and then burning the gas in turbines and making electricity and recovering the heat. Um, and we are registered in DC and Maryland uh, in the US here um, as a, a renewable energy source. So not only are we getting clean, green, re renewable energy, but I'm selling about a million dollars a year of renewable energy credits, RECs in DC. But I also think that it is an energy use when we put it back on the land, because if our farmers use it, then they're not buying ammonium nitrate and ammonium nitrate and other fertilizers takes an enormous amount of energy to make. So we're avoiding that energy use if we're using our biosolids in the field. We've also done work that shows that if we use biosolids, and this I could talk for hours about this, but because of the microbial activity at the treatment plant, uh, we excrete these essential plant hormones, which allows crops to get through uh, stressful conditions like drought. And then of course, there are all the beneficial microbes that um, help promote disease resistance in the crops. Um, so, you know, like, as I mentioned, we have for many years, a couple decades had a successful class B biosolids program because, and that allowed us to take it down to farms in Virginia and Maryland. Uh, but now we have this new equipment. We, in, we installed these digesters five years ago, preceded by Canby thermal hydrolysis. And now we have this real, I, I can't emphasize enough what a beautiful biosolids product that comes out of this. And it has opened up new marketing opportunities. Not only is it, I, I always say it's class A and beyond. Class A in, in, the, in the States allows us to market it to the public, but it's, it's more than just class A. Class A has to do with the reduction of pathogens. It is also extremely stable and a very low odor product, which allows us to blend it in and use it and sell it directly to, 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 to end users. Um, it's, it's a really nice product. So it's opened up all these different marketing opportunities. We don't have to go to farms. We can, we can use it in the, in the city. So the, pro, the process is, I'll just go through this very simply, but it's, it's a really nice, uh, elegantly simple process. Uh, we collect the solids. It goes through the thermal hydrolysis process, which is high heat, high pressure. It's 160 degrees centigrade, which absolutely obliterates all of the, the pathogens. Um, and it's, High-ish high pressure, it's about 90 PSI. 
about six bars of pressure. Uh, this last tank here is a flash tank and that, that tank is back at atmospheric pressure. So that sudden pressure difference causes the cells to burst and it makes it very easy to mix. So then we can put it into the digesters at 10% solids rather than 5% solids. We get good mixing, we get great gas production. We clean up the gas, uh, burn the gas in these turbines, convert it to energy, um, use the energy on the plant. We use all the energy on the plant, about seven megawatts of power. Uh, but you know, when the turbines spin, they generate heat. We recover that heat, convert it to steam, and then that is what we use to heat up the thermal hydrolysis. So it's incredibly energy efficient. And again, we're selling those energy credits as well. Program benefits are that we re reduce the quantity of biosolids that we have to manage. Um, we improve the quality, class A and more. We generate this eight megawatts of power, cut our greenhouse gas emissions by about 50%. This one project cut our gr greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. And oh, by the way, we're saving millions of dollars. So it's, it's really this project that, um, it's the perfect municipal project. It makes great environmental sense. It makes great fiscal sense. Um, and we're very proud of it. So from the very beginning, we knew that we wanted to have a product that we were going to sell to the public. So we, we had a launch event for when we started up the digesters. This, you can't just passively put the, a product out and expect the public to accept it. So we had this digester launch event where we brought in um, important people. People. This is the mayor of DC. This is our um, representative in the US Congress. This is our board chair, our general manager, a very influential city council member, representative from EPA, Department of Energy. And we talked about the green energy. We also had them ceremoniously plant a tree with our biosolids product. And the mayor tweeted about it. She was very, she was amazed that we were doing this right in her backyard. So um, we all know that these technologies are, are possible in our industry, but we need to disseminate that information. So we also connected with the DC gardening community so that we would um, get them to understand that this is a safe product. We made presentations at some of their events. We even sponsored a couple of their events. Didn't cost us very much money, but it, it bought us a lot of trust. <laughs> uh, and as a result, we've been able to use our product on community gardens throughout the city. We're on over 80 community gardens. We're on um, 35 schools. And um, it's a trusted product in the community. It's really nice. I especially like this one in the middle here. This is a woman who runs the Washington Youth Garden and it is run at the uh, Washington Arboretum. She brings kids in for camps in the summer and she teaches them about gardening. And she really, she teaches ki city kids where food comes from. I think that they all think that it comes from the grocery store, but it doesn't, of course, it comes out of the ground. And she used our product to grow these, these vegetables. She taught them about it. She understood the science. She understood the risks were very low. And she fed the food to the kids. Um, and, and then she got on social media and talked about it. So it was, it was tremendously helpful to, to build these kind of partnerships. We've branded our products. Uh, we want people to recognize it as a product in the community. Uh, we don't hide the fact that it comes from wastewater. Um, we bag some product and it's on the, all the information's on the bag. It's bloom. Uh, the infinity symbol in the middle sort of connotes recycling. Uh, I like the, the tagline, good soil, better earth. Good soil is very obvious, but better earth opens up the conversation to talking about green energy and sequestration of carbon and the reduction of our carbon footprint. Uh, if you're interested in more information, we have a website, bloomsoil.com. Check it out. It has tons of information on it. So our marketing approach has been that we wanted to focus on soil blenders and landscapers and uh, tree nurseries and farms, of course, um, government agencies. We've been going to trade shows. You know, we, in our, in our profession, we, we go to our wastewater <laughs> trade shows and we go to WEFTEC and IWA conferences. But we don't cr cross pollinate a whole lot. So it's been really fun to to go to things like Mance, which is the Mid-Atlantic Nursery Trade Show, and we talk about our product, and and everybody's very excited about it. It's it's really interesting. We do public speaking, we do tours of the plant, we do employee and community giveaways occasionally just to build interest. Um, we purchased a couple of our own delivery vehicles, and we started with a very low price for early adopters, but since then we've insisted on getting a market rate for the product. We have several Bloom products. We have a product called Fresh Bloom. That's just really the stuff that comes straight off the re, uh, 
dewatering belt. That's this dark product in the in the front here. And you can see it's it's this really beautiful product. If you come up to it and you put it in your hand, you can and you put your face in it, you can smell a little bit of ammonia coming off, but that's it. Um, and of course, ammonia dis, uh, dis disseminates or uh, dis, um, dilutes very easily. So if you get 20 feet away from the pile, you can't even smell it. The product back here is cured bloom. It's really, it's just dried in windrows. We dry it to about 50% solids. And then it, it just looks just like this beautiful soil product. Um, and that is the product that we're putting in bags. We're bagging it, selling in local garden centers. And then we're making some blended products too uh, with um, wood fines and sawdust and sand and different things. We have a small blending facility on site that we built. I snuck it into the budget and it's great. I mean, I, I wish that we had built it larger. We don't have a lot of space at, at Blue Plains, our wastewater treatment plant. So we, we put it in really the only available space that we had and we immediately hit capacity. We we're already at the point where we could use a, a site that's twice this large uh, because there's a huge demand for good soil products. Um, we also have a small greenhouse here where we do some growth trials and some demonstration growing. Users of the blend include construction uh, sites. This is a, a, a uh, construction site, a, a highway project just north of us. It's about 10 miles north of us. Uh, and they, part of the construction project is that they built this interchange, um, highway interchange, and they had to grow grass around it. And the soil was so bad that they couldn't get any grass to grow. So they brought our product in, blended it in with the um, existing soil. And um, I have a photo to show you next about how great the grass growing was. The architect of the Capitol, US Capitol uses our product all over the mall and around the tidal basin. Uh, it's really great. Uh, this is this is a project where we brought fresh bloom into a neighborhood in DC. You can see there are houses right here. This is the pile of, of bloom right here. We tilled it in. Um, it was a landscape architect who was um, revitalizing this park. No complaints. Beautiful, beautiful end result. It was great. Um, this is that highway project that I mentioned. This is the highway project afterwards. Uh, they could not believe how fast the grass grew up. And it really, I mean, it's just, just mother nature at work. You get the conditions right, you make the soil uh, um, healthy and we get good grass growth. Um, and as I mentioned, we are now bagging some bloom. It's available in stores in Maryland and DC. So we now have, um, some really, really strong partners in DC uh, because of the, the legwork that we did ahead of time. Um, this is a, a group called Casey Trees. It's a nonprofit in DC whose mission it is to um, increase the tree canopy in DC for a number of reasons. You know, it, uh, it's beautiful. It also uh, sequesters carbon. It reduces the temperature of the city, but it also helps us because the more trees that we have, the more rainwater gets captured and does not end up on the streets and it doesn't end up down at our treatment plant. So um, it's great. They use our product now exclusively for um, planting their trees. It's not a huge quantity, but it, it has meant so much to us to have this trusted environmental group use our product. Um, and we, we do a specialized mix for them because it, there's a tree planting mix that we do for them. So I, I love this photo. This is the first delivery that we made in 20, I think it was 2016 to a church in Maryland. Uh, we, we brought some product out to them and they tilled it in uh, and it was a check for, I don't know, something like $37. And we were so excited to get it. We gave it to our finance people. They didn't know what to do with it. We said, just cash it, <laughs> cash it, cash it, cash it. Um, and I bring this up because I wanted to show you this next. Uh, you know, over the course of the last five years, we've set progressively greater goals uh, for sales. Um, we set a goal of 20 in 2016 of a thousand tons, which is not very much. We produce 165,000 tons a year and we almost achieved that. I'm gonna round up and say that we hit a thousand tons and we saved $34,000 over our other biocells reuse options. Um, and we made about $5,000 in revenue and we were thrilled, $39,000, whew. Um, you know, cut to 2020 and we set a goal of 60,000 tons. We're on target to, to meet that. We're, we're actually, because of the pandemic, we're going to fall a little bit short of that. But the savings over our other land re 
land use options is $2 million. We made $300,000 in revenue. So the total turnaround there is $2.3 million. And this happened in, over the course of five years. So I, I just want to emphasize that there is a market for this product. Um, and uh, if you make a good product, people will, will buy it. So again, in closing, I'd just like to point out that um, there is no such thing as waste, only wasted resources. And we have to figure out a way, much like Frank and his algae and his car, um, I, I dream of a day where every garden in DC is planted with our product. And, and I can tell everybody, you know, that's, that's your soil right there. <laughs> we just turned it around for you. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed for that uh, look at the work you've been undertaking in in DC. Um, yeah, thanks. It seems that you've had to put put an enormous amount of uh, effort into uh, uh, in, engaging all of the stakeholders from the uh, from the local community. Um, how how far has that involved sort of cultural change within the utility itself in order to get people focused on on doing that and delivering those targets? Yeah, I mean, I, when I presented this to the board, they all said, yeah, go ahead, give it a shot, Chris. <laughs> I don't think that there was great confidence that we'd be able to do this, but I, I hired a couple people who were incredibly enthusiastic, um, passionate about this. I hired them based on their passion, not on their technical knowledge, and it has been tremendously valuable. Uh, they believed in what we were trying to do and um, took it very seriously. So. I have a small but very dedicated group. And I would suggest that if somebody is trying to do this, that they hire uh, uh, along those lines as well, get somebody who believes in it. Uh, and now, now the board, you know, the question is uh, how can you sell more? Because <laughs> they understand that it, it works and that, that, that it's real. Um, so it, yes, it, it took a, a, a ground up approach to get it throughout the whole organization. Fantastic, Chris. Thank you for uh, taking us on that journey through the DC Water uh, experience and the development of the, the Bloom brand. And um, we've got to move on to our next uh, case study, uh, which is looking at innovations uh, in dewatering. It's going to be presented by Dinesh Gahani, who's the regional product sales manager uh, APAC for the Gear Group in India. Uh, Gear Group is one of the largest providers of equipment process technology for the food, energy and environmental industries, where it ranks among the market and technologies leaders. Uh, within the environmental field, Gear Separation focuses on efficient solutions for sludge thick thickening and pre-watering uh, and utilising state-of-the-art decanter centrifuges. Gear solutions are sold worldwide and Dinesh is responsible for leading their commercial development throughout India. So over to you now, Dinesh, to give us a look at dewatering. 